So we, last month, covered the French Revolution, uh, and as we said many times during that pre presentation, what the French were after were the same goals that we had achieved with our revolution, freedom from a, a monarchy and a democracy. And the French hoped to get it, and as we will conclude with this today, you will see that they did not. They got freedom from a, a monarchy only to earn an emperor. And then, of course, it goes back to the monarchy after Napoleon is gone, and we'll get to that point um, shortly. Okay, so Napoleon. Was he tall or short? <laughs> short. Um, we'll get into some of that as well, too. Okay, some of the myths and legends about Napoleon, some of the myths and legends about Josephine, the uh, legendary romance that they uh, enjoy, and then uh, about his quest to... Um, to conquer Europe. All right, so you have our normal agenda slide up here. You can see where we are in the, in the course of events in May. When we come back, we will cover the other two movements that were going on concurrent to the American Revolution, the French Revolution. We've already talked about the Enlightenment, which was when the philosophers got together and, and came up with better ways to rule their, uh, their peoples. Uh, but we have two other movements that were going on. One is the Romantic Age, and one is the Scientific Revolution. So we will talk about them in May, take our normal break for June, July, and August, and then come back in, uh, in September. Okay? Ready to go? All right, Napoleon. Um, nickname the Little Corporal. Part of that was derogatory, part of it was complimentary. Little, because he isn't tall. This is not a name that was called to him to his face. It was behind, used behind his back. The little part of it, of course, is reference his, his relative lack of stature. The corporal part is actually a compliment, because you've had anything to do with the Army or the Marine Corps, you know the corporal is a rank to which privates aspire because they have shown the demonstration of some modicum of leadership. It's kind of like being an apprentice to a sergeant. So if your commander identifies you as a private as someone that he wants to groom to become, a sergeant, they'll promote you to corporal and give you a shot leading four or five people and see how you do. So because of his work ethic, because of his leadership qualities, his soldiers gave him that name and it was meant to be complimentary in that regard. Although he's going to kill about a million of his soldiers, there was still, still high respect felt for him uh, in the military. The Corsican, he is born in, uh, in Corsica. The Jaxio. And those of you who have been on Mediterranean cruises, you know, coming up out of Rome, which is here, um, you know, you come through here, you look at Mount Etna spewing, you know, ashes and all that kind of stuff, and come up through here. You, some of you may have landed at the Jaxio. This is the uh, statue of him. Um, my daughter Melissa and I standing on the side of it so you can get kind of the, the size of it there. Great pride in him there. You can actually visit his house, his birthplace. They actually have his family tree painted on the wall of the bedroom, supposedly, where he was born. So it's, they take a lot of pride there in the fact that that was the birthplace of Napoleon. He's also nicknamed the Liberator. He shares that nickname with Simone Bolivar, who we are about ready to get to here this fall as the great liberator of two or three of the countries from Spain and South America. So the Liberator... Although it's probably better suited to Simone Bolivar than it is to Napoleon, because Napoleon came in and he liberated them from monarchs, and they gave these countries in Europe him as the emperor. Well, as a matter of fact, he actually had, of his seven siblings, he gave five of them countries to rule. Uh, so, kind of a liberator, but kind of not. But that is a, a nickname. So, if you ever go on Jeopardy, I actually saw this question on Jeopardy there a month or so ago about the two people who had the names Liberator, and it was Bolivar and uh, Napoleon. So his famous quotation in this regard, war with all kings, peace for all peoples. Um, and that's right, he did defeat kings, but he became the emperor over those countries. And I am the revolution. All right, a picture there of young Napoleon. So he's the second oldest, oldest of eight children, so that's where these seven siblings come from. Um, born Italian, but he's going to become a French citizen when France takes over Corsica, so that's why he doesn't end up in the Italian army, he ends up in the French army. Uh, his father dies when Napoleon is 16, and um, we're not certain what his motivation is, but he leaves. 
Uh, the people who think better of him think he went to support his family, to earn money to support his family. Others who are less attracted to Napoleon will say he was just running away from home. So he goes. He joins the army in 16, uh, and he becomes an officer uh, at that point in time. So there's about nine years there where he serves in the army with, I guess, some distinction, but he doesn't reach headline news status until he's a captain of artillery in the streets of Paris during a particular revolution against, or an uprising against the revolutionaries. And he is ordered to clear the streets of these revolutionaries. And he proudly reports to his superiors that the mission was accomplished. He cleared the streets of Paris with the whiff of grape shot. Now those of you who know anything about the military know the grape shot is actually what? It's like a big shotgun shell. It's like an artillery, I mean a shotgun shell shot out of an artillery piece. And back then these were examples of the type of grape shot that they would load, grape shot rounds that they would load in these cannons. And I have as an example, if you didn't have any of the fancier grape shot kind of rounds, just go ahead and throw whatever you find on the city streets down the barrel and shoot it off. So he had absolutely no compunction about firing on citizens of his own country with this stuff, because those were the orders that he, he was given. Well, in recognition of that, and some other things that he had done, he is promoted from captain to brigadier general. He skips major, lieutenant colonel, and colonel. He skips over some officers who are senior to him and thought that they should have been promoted ahead of him, and that's going to create some problems for him later on among some of his senior officers, because he skipped over them to get to where he is. So, 26 years old, headline news in Paris, well liked by the leadership of France at this point in time, given more and more positions of responsibility, and that is in 1795. The next year, he is, uh, is going to meet Josephine, interesting gal. She is a Creole, and if you remember when we talked about the colonies in the Americas, the definition of a Creole is a purebred European who happens to be born in the Americas. And so that's what she is. She is in the West Indies. Uh, she meets her husband there, marries him at age 16, bears two children. The uh, husband is called back to France. Uh, he loses a battle in Germany. The revolutionaries don't like, much like Hitler, don't like defeats. So they execute him. She becomes a widow. She then, but without support, becomes a woman of favor, shall we say, among the noble class of France, and it's because, that's why she supports herself. And it's through those, through those relationships, she becomes acquainted with Napoleon, they fall in love, they have this famous romance, and uh, they will end up getting married. Uh, so when they get married, uh, she is six years older than him. He is 26. No, 27 when they get married, she is 33. So this starts as, uh, this famous uh, romance. So that later that next year, he is awarded command of an army um, that is fighting the Austra Australians. Uh, the Austrians in Italy, he defeats them at this famous battle of, of Rivoli. He becomes famous, even more famous than he was. And they said, well, you're doing such a good job of that. Why don't you try to extend the French Empire by conquering Egypt? So here the French supposedly are attempting to maintain some sort of stability in their country after the French Revolution, but they're still members of the French government who want to reach out and create this empire in Europe. And so they dispatch Napoleon to uh, Egypt with the support navy. The navy is only there really to support him with supplies, not necessarily to fight. Napoleon does okay on the ground. He defeats the ground forces. The problems are he can't get any supply and reinforcements from home. It's a lot like what happened to uh, the Romans in the First Punic War when they went down and attacked North Africa. They couldn't get the support that they needed because of the Car Carthaginian Navy at that point in time. Uh, so, the commander of the Navy that defeats whatever French Navy is there is Lord Nelson, Horatio Nelson. There are going to be two British officers in this period of the Napoleonic Wars who are going to be undefeated against Napoleon. One is Horatio Nelson, and who's the other? I should ask Mike Burke this question. Mike probably knows the answer. Where is Mike sitting today? He's probably not going to draw attention to me today. Well, is he hiding? Oh, you're hiding behind a post. You sly rascal. I'm trying to think of the guy. 
No, I know. Duke of Wellington. Duke of Wellington. Okay. Okay, I'm not going to pick on you, although I should ask. It's 116 years. Good. How long? How long the Hundred Years' War is? That's always that's the question that Mike remembers. 116 years, but Hundred Years' War. Good. Thank you, Mike. All right. So what is going to happen here during this Egyptian campaign? Napoleon is going to be successful on the ground. His navy is defeated at sea in the Mediterranean. Can't get support in. But there is one other interesting and we would consider fairly critical discovery that it's made during this campaign, and it's the discovery of the Rosetta Stone. French uh, engineers are working on an irrigation project along the, uh, along the Nile River, and they come across this rock that's got writing on it. And they evacuate it to France. It takes about 25 years for them to translate it, but it helps translate what? Hieroglyphics. Uh, so there are um, two versions of Greek, one version of, of hieroglyphics, and uh, it takes, like I say, 25 years for them to compare what they have here uh, with those three different columns or, or lines of writing, and that helps solve the puzzle of what hieroglyphics is. So that's one successful thing that happens as a result of, of Napoleon being in Egypt. <clears throat> he's down there, he's isolated, his army can't get out. So what does he do? He leaves. And he leaves most of his army there. Some of his army actually makes it back by walking. And if you're going to walk from Egypt to France, how do you get there? But anyway, it's a long walk. All right? You go through back then Palestine and Turkey and all the rest of that to get on around. But they do make it back. This is much like what happens. Um, Napoleon took this on himself to leave. But remember in World War II, when Erwin Rommel was defeated by the British and the, and the Americans down in North Africa, they left the army there and sent an airplane to get Rommel out and take him back to, to Europe to, to work on the, the Atlantic Wall. So it's, it's kind of like that, and then we have these two relatively su successful ground commanders that are felt to be critical to their country who make it out of Africa, make it out of Egypt, uh, to fight another day. Three years later, two years later, he joins a coup against the revolutionary government at that time. There's a triumvirate or a councilate that is established that has three guys. And of those three guys, who's going to become the most powerful? Napoleon. And he names himself First Council. It's his first political office. He's 30 years old. And he is now basically in charge of France. It takes him five years to like it so much that he names himself. Who names him emperor? He does, all right, because there's no one to say no to him at that point in time. So in uh, 1804, he names himself an emperor Napoleon I, anticipating what? That there will be a Napoleon II. Uh, so he is, he is lining France up for what they did not, what they fought the French Revolution about, which was to get rid of all these monarchies, and he's setting them up for another, uh, another lineage. Uh, he invites the Pope. Uh, the Pope is going to crown him, but he does, uh, Napoleon does exactly the same thing. We talked about Charlemagne on Christmas Day of, 18, of 800, uh, inviting the Pope uh, to crown him. But Napoleon does the same thing that Charlemagne did uh, all those years ago, a thousand years before. Takes the crown from the Pope, crowns himself, as if to say to the Pope, there's only one guy in charge around here, but thanks for coming. Uh, he also takes the crown uh, that is meant for Josephine. So in this painting, uh, if you can see, here's Josephine here kneeling before Napoleon as he's about ready to place the crown on her head. And this part of their romance comes to fruition as she becomes the Empress of France. We have Napoleon and Josephine on the throne. All right. Napoleon is a clever rascal, and he has seen the dilemmas that these other governments have had that have been just trying to establish themselves, the revolutionary governments have tried to establish themselves since the revolution. And he now realizes he's got to make different groups of Frenchmen happy if he's going to stay in front power. So, who does they all need to keep happy? He needs to keep the middle class, the bourgeoisie, happy. And if you remember from the French Revolution, the problem that the middle class was having was about jobs and financial stability. So what's Napoleon going to do? He's going to create jobs, and he's going to establish a bank 
to help these businessmen who are concerned about financial stability help stabilize the currency of France. So to win the middle class, creates jobs, sets up the middle bank, or the, it sets up this national bank. Is the middle class happy with this? Yep. Yep. They are happy. All right, so who else do we have to keep happy? How about the lower class? They were principally the people going around chopping folks' heads off, so how are we going to keep them happy? Remember what started this thing? Let them eat cake? So what's the problem that the lower class has? No bread. So there's food problems. There are job problems with them as well. They also, if you remember, when the revolutionary government took over and the nobles left, remember the nobles of France fled out of fear? What did the revolutionary government do with some of that land? Who did they give it to? The lower class. The lower class like that? They did. But then as the, as the, the governments matured, they started taking it back from the, from the lower class. So how can Napoleon make the lower class happy? He can make sure they've got food, and allow them to keep most of the land that they gained during the revolution. Is the lower class becoming happier with Napoleon? Yep. All right. So he's got the middle working on the middle class, working on the lower class. This guy's a politician. He's not only a, an outstanding military leader. This guy is a politician. The nobles, or most of the nobles, outside of France, because during the revolution, what they do? They ran. He needs them back. Does he need them back, or does he need their, their wallet back? He wants their wallet back. So how's he going to get them back? Well, one thing that the, that the government did to these nobles when they left was they made them criminals. I mean, you guys are criminals. You fled the country we need. So they all have wanted posters out there for them. So what can he grant them? Pardons. He grants these nobles pardons, and he tells them, if you come back, are you going to be coming back to nothing? No, you got to give them something. You maybe not be able to give them all the land they had before, but they can give them something. And then the last thing I'm going to do for you, says Napoleon, is we're going to have a club. And we're going to have a club of noblemen. And you can't say that you're in the nobleman's club unless you're on my list. And so he makes out a list of who all the noblemen are of France. And if you're on that list, you want to go back there and be part of this club. So that's what he does for the upper class. Return some of the land. Pardons, and there are 3,263 names on the nobleman's list of France. And you wanted to be on that name, on that list. So is he winning the support of the upper class? Yeah. Who else does he have to worry about? Who does every dictator have to get the support of if they're going to stay in power? Well, the church. We'll get to the church last. The military. Got to get the army. In. And he's an army officer, for Pete's sake. And they like him for the most part. So he, has, he doesn't have to worry about turning his back on the military. So he's got the support of them uh, already. And we'll go back. Uh, we haven't gotten to this point yet, but this is much like what uh, Mrs. Astor did in New York City. You guys remember in the late 1800s, she established the 400, which was this list, her official list, the invitee list for all great social functions in New York City in the late 1800s. And you wanted to be on that list. It's the same thing that's going on here. Uh, with the nobles at this point in time. Some of you mentioned the church. Is he that concerned that he needs the church on his side? He needs the church on his side in appearances. Maybe not on his side wholeheartedly, or maybe not he and the courts are in the church's court, but he wants to at least appear that they're at peace. So what he does is he signs a peace treaty, a concordant with the church, which basically says, we're going to give you some of your land back, um, not much of it, but you can have enough for your cathedrals and, your, and uh, all the rest, wherever your parishes think that they need to have a control of land or in the local communities. We're going to give that back. Um, in agreement, and the Pope says, okay, I'd rather be in some position of responsibility or authority in France than none at all. And so they basically buy into this. They say, okay, we're not going to demand everything back. Just let us be in kind of a, an equal position with you. Napoleon gives face value to that. But what we know from Napoleon's writings was that this was a temporary peace. What he designed to have happen before he left power, and he didn't live long to put this in effect, was that he was going to make the Pope subordinate to him. Much like in the Byzantine Empire with the Greek Orthodox Church where the Patriarch was subordinate to the Emperor of the Byzantine Empire, that's the pattern, or that's the, uh, the motif that, uh, that Napoleon wanted to set up. So that's what this last little part is here. 
that he was going to put himself in charge of the Catholic Church and make the Pope an employee. Uh, he just didn't live long. He had other stuff he wanted to do before he actually uh, took that action. Okay, so Napoleon, it takes him, you know, a year or so to kind of start to establish this. So this now gives him the confidence that he can do what and feel safe about his, his reign. He can leave the country. Because what does he want to do? He wants to conquer Europe. But he has to do this at home to make sure that he has a stable base so that he can leave the country and not worry about people overthrowing him while he's gone. And we're going to have the statistic up here in a second, but I think like 75% of the time that he is in power, he's out of the country, conquering other, other peoples out there. So he's got to have confidence that there's enough stability behind him that he can do that. That's what he accomplishes in this first year, so it's time then uh, to go to war. Well, the last thing. Got this little piece in here. It's the legal system. The Napoleonic Code was the legal system that he set up, uh, the laws that he wrote. Um, it was the basis for some of our laws, some of the thinking that went into our laws um, in the early, early uh, 19th century. But today, it's still the basis of law in three places. What are the three places where the Napoleonic Code is still the principal format for law? One is obvious France. The other two are in North America. Yes. Louisiana and? Canada. Well, not all of Canada. Quebec. Quebec. Very good. You guys are on the ball today. That's excellent. So those three places still are impacted greatly by the Napoleonic Code today. Okay. Did ignore some freedoms. There are no free elections. Do you have elections forever? Uh -huh, no. So no, no, like, thank you, Bruce. It's good to have lawyers in town so that you <laughs> get answers to those hard questions. That's good. Um, no freedom of the press. He's going to close newspapers. He's going to close theaters. Um, you could basically say anything you wanted as long as you said, I like Napoleon. Uh, and that's, you know, what, what, he, what he expected to have happen. Uh, Napoleon was in charge. Okay, so let's go to war. Very famous painting here by Jacques David. Jacques Louis David. Um, you know, we've talked about this before when I talked about my high school class to the kids about the concept of bias in art and literature, about how you can usually tell who wrote it, who painted it, who drew it by the way that they portray something. There's bias in this painting. And the bias has to do with physicality. Does this painting make Napoleon look like he is five foot six? No. He's either riding a pony or this guy has him about six foot six, you know, domineering over this guy. This is definite bias. Does Napoleon like this painting? Your darn toot me likes this painting. And to me, he gets, you know, <laughs> you know, free passes to the palace or something. I don't know, whatever it is that you got from Napoleon if you made him happy. A famous painting down at the bottom here, we'll talk about these guys a little bit later, are some of the, the more famous of the uh, leaders. It's cut off in this one, but Hannibal is down here, Julius Caesar's down here, some of these, as if he is now bypassing their record and becoming greater military commanders than they were. All right, I could beat you to death with the Napoleonic Wars, but I'm not going to. There are just a couple, three that we need to point out because they are so significant. He has aims to defeat England. Uh, we go back in history, it would go all the way back to 1066. Remember that's when the Normans came across uh, the English Channel, the last time England has ever been successfully invaded. And it set up this intense rivalry between England and France that's going to go on until this period of time. So we're going to have 800 years of conflict between England and France, initiated by the Normans when they went across in 1066. So, like a lot of other guys, <laughs> Napoleon has the ambition to defeat, to invade and defeat England. He has a fleet. The British have a fleet. He is, Napoleon is fearful and respectful. Maybe not so much fearful as respectful of the British fleet. To the point that he does not station the main part of his fleet on the English Channel. He paces it on the, Mediter on the Mediterranean ports of France. That's where the French fleet is. Well, to invade England, you got to get your ships to England. And if they're going to come out of the Mediterranean, there's only one point they're going to come out. And where is that point? Gibraltar, the Straits of Gibraltar. 
which is also known, there's a port on there on the Moroccan side known as Trafalgar, and that's where the name for this battle comes, because the British know this. Their spies tell them that they're coming, and they're coming from the coast of France. So what does the British Navy do? They just come out, and they sit there at the Straits of, of Gibraltar, at Trafalgar, and wait for them to come out. Boy, you talk about wanting to be in, a, in a, some sort of aircraft above this and watch what happens. I would have loved to have seen how this happened. Can you imagine to have this mass of 40 or 50 British ships out there waiting for 33 French ships to come out through? And what? And this artist has tried to capture what that would have looked like. That would have been awesome. Absolutely awesome. And then, of course, you, well, I don't know about it, the violence that followed was, was significant as well. So here they come. So here you see, we call it Trafalgar. Um, very significant battle in, in terms of English and French relations because they have to come out here to get up here. Uh, so the French are going to lose 20 of their 33 ships. The English lose none. Uh, they're damaged, but they don't sink. But the French do lose that many ships. Um, and the commander of the British fleet is Horatio Nelson. Same guy that defeated the British Navy off the coast of Egypt in uh, about, what, nine years before. Um, the tragedy here is what happens to Nelson. He dies, all right? There's a French, a tactic back then was to have snipers up in the mass looking down on the decks and identifying who the officers are and trying to shoot them and take them out of play, and that's what happens. There's a, uh, a French sniper that gets up in the mass and uh, shoots him. Now, Nelson is a terrific, I admire him a lot. He's a terrific leader, uh, very brave. Loses his right eye, his right arm in sea battles before here. Uh, but the classic story about him is he's, he's, he's the captain of a ship in a uh, British fleet that's fly, fighting off the Danish coast. And he is working for an admiral that is not known for his courage under fire. And as the Danes come out and they start to initiate the fire with the British fleet, this British captain, admiral of the of this fleet, gets a little skittish and sends flags up, because that's the way they, they signaled back then, to retreat, to leave the battlefield. Huh. Nelson sees this with his, with his one good eye, but then tells his first mate, hand me the telescope so I can see the, clear, the signal more clearly, holds the telescope up to his right eye, says, huh, I don't see any such order, continue to fight. And he almost single-handedly wins this battle, embarrasses the admiral, but that gives you an indication of who he is and the, the willingness he is to, to fight. So the painting of him, this is him lying on the deck of the ship after he has been engaged by this uh, sniper. He will die on board the ship. Um, but they want to get him back. Well, supposedly, his last words, thank God I've done my duty. Do we know that these are the last words that any of these guys speak? You know, uh, John Money told me the other day that you know I want my last words to be I am the greatest. So I, you know, I'll, I'll report that. I'll report that to historians. We're not sure that that's exactly what he said. Right? I, yeah, I can say that because Rose's not here tonight. So, okay. Um, remember? Well, you might not. Well, some of you will. We talked about William the Conqueror going to uh, England and conquering the Normans conquering the English and how he was killed in, in battle later and how they tried to get his body back to uh, the chapel to be uh, uh, buried. And when they tried to stuff his body into the casket, it basically exploded because it was all swollen and all that. All, there was part of William here and part of William here and all that. Uh, they learned from the lesson and they said, well, we want to get, we want to get Nelson back to England to bury him. So we're going to put him in a brandy cake, and that's what they did. They opened up a brandy cake, put his body in it, kind of like formaldehyde, I guess, was preserving it, and got him back home. So if you want to see a likeness of Horatio Nelson today, where do you go? Brandy cake. <laughs> brandy cake. You, uh, you go to London, and you go to... Trafalgar Square. Thank you, General Murray. Uh, Trafalgar Square. So if you ever driven around Trafalgar Square there, the traffic circle, and looked up there, oh, there's a guy in a statue way up there. Well, that's Horatio Nelson. And, well, I know, but you're right. But it's not right. 
Uh, well, the reason it looks like this, in this case, it's pinned, because he doesn't have a right arm. He just pins his jacket uh, there is what that's for. Um, okay, so he's frustrated. Poland is frustrated with, with, uh, with England. He can't get in. So he decides, I'm gonna, they're an island. I can starve them out. So since by this point in time, he owns most, or he controls most all of, of Europe and his trading lanes, he orders people not to trade with England. And this really puts England in a bind for a while. And as an example of the straits that England goes into, they pass what is called the English Bread Law, which makes it illegal for bakers to sell bread unless it's a day old. Now, those of you who had the really natural bread that they make in, in Europe without all the preservatives in it, you know that after about three hours, let alone a day, I mean, that stuff is already turning stale. And supposedly, the emphasis here was, or the thought was, people eat a lot of bread because it tastes good right out of the oven. But the longer you let it sit, the staler it becomes, so they're not going to be interested in eating so much stale bread, so that's going to conserve our wheat. That's really a, a very... Machiavellian way of looking on how you preserve wheat, but that's what they did. And it did help England survive this until uh, basically Napoleon was out of uh, impact. Another place where Napoleon had trouble was in Spain. He went down into Spain. He didn't personally fight all these battles, but he dispatched generals to go down there and fight. And he had trouble down there uh, because the Spanish introduced him to reintroduce well, I introduced France to guerrilla warfare. Now, the French had seen this in the American colonies. You know, the French came and helped it, but they had never employed it themselves. Well, now the Portuguese are employing it, and some of the French, the boss, those kind of people are employing it against them, and they're, they are not going to be successful in Spain on the battlefield. And basically, what Napoleon does is turn his back on that and say, I'm going to go deal with the rest of Europe, and I'll come back to Spain. He never does. Um, so, guerrilla, meaning little war in... Um, in Spanish. And one of the leaders down there, um, British generals, is the Duke of Wellington. Uh, Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. This is going to be the other British commander that's going to be undefeated against Napoleon. Horatio Nelson on the sea and the Duke of Wellington uh, on the ground. While this is going on, um, Napoleon proves his mettle by winning the most successful battle he will ever win. He goes into um, Austria at Austerlitz, and uh, he's going to defeat a battle, which is the home team, the home team of Austria, and then their allies, Prussia and Russia, at a place called Austerlitz. And here's Austerlitz here, mid-Austria, just north of Vienna. And uh, this is called Napoleon's greatest victory, because he comes in with about half the force that the home team has. So he's fighting, he's fighting as the visitors, he's at half strength, he doesn't necessarily know the land, and he's gonna win. Um, it's, it's, it's thought that 25,000, 25% of the Austrian and Russian, Russian force were uh, killed. And to show you how ruthless Napoleon is going to be, this is fought in December, so there's a frozen lake behind him that the, the Austrians try to retreat across. And so Napoleon just fires his artillery into the, into the ice, breaks the ice, and many of these 25,000 drown in this icy lake because that's the way that Napoleon get, uh, kills them. His thinking is, if I kill them today, I won't have to fight them later. And uh, this is the way that he's going to employ his forces oftentimes during this period of time. The politician in Napoleon also comes out during this period of time because he's got to go back. He loses soldiers too. And he's got to go back to Paris and get more soldiers. But he needs the support of the people to get those soldiers. And so what he does this time as a political move is he identifies all of the kids, has his people identify all of the kids who became orphans because of this fight, and he adopts them. Gives these kids his name so that they can then go get food and later on education using his name. That's the politician in him coming out as well as the, uh, uh, the military uh, leader. Okay, so over time, it's going to take him about seven years, he is going to gain control of most all of Europe. And is he going to want to stop there? No. He has two things in Europe that are still hanging over him. One is this down here. And he's, but he says, you know, this isn't important to me right now. They're not coming across the Pyrenees and attacking me. So we can let that one go. 
I'm not doing all that great over here either, but we'll just let that one sit for a while. But I'm not done. Um, I want to go down to Egypt, but I don't want to go through the Ottoman Empire to get there. I don't want to fight this business again. So that leaves him the Far East. And he literally goes after India and China by going by, and his goal is to go through what country? Russia. Russia. So we get to 1812, and this is the famous battle with Russia. He has 600,000 guys. 600,000 soldiers. Now when we talk about the American Revolution, we have maybe 15,000 soldiers involved in the battle. He has 600,000 soldiers. Now, what's his big issue? He has two big issues. Well, three, if you count the army. I'll, I'll throw the Russian army in as a concern. But what are the two geographically oriented issues that he has with Russia? Coal Dam. It is a big, stinking place. So the cold impacts him, and the, he's on horseback, or he's walking, or they're dragging cannons or whatever, and he's got to wait for the ground to dry after the snow melt. He's got to wait till after mud season to go in there. He would have loved to have started in April or May, but he can't. He's got to wait till June. He's got 600,000 guys that are going to have to go 600 miles. So they start off here on the border of Poland, and they've got to go to Moscow. All right, I'm going to give you a mission today that there's an enemy army in El Paso, 600 miles from here. And I want you to take the male population of San Antonio, which is about 600,000, and I want you to march them across to El Paso, beat them on the way, by the way, and then defeat the army that's waiting for you when you get to El Paso. How many in here are going to willingly accept that mission? Well, that's what he's going to try to do. So, 600 miles, 600,000 guys, you can't start till June, and you've got to get there and win the battle before what happens? It starts snowing again, which is going to be in October or so. <laughs> mission impossible, but he's going to try it anyway. All right, so he's going to start off. And initially... The Russians don't really oppose him that much. Oh, they ambush him you know, from the tree lines periodically. Like but you're not going to make, it, make a big dent in 600,000 guys by doing that. But as he marches along, and, well, first of all, how's he expected to support these troops? How's he going to feed them? Well, I hear the word capture. Let's use the word forage. Forage means what? Live off the land. All right, you come up on the farm, you, comp, you, you slaughter all the cows and the pigs and the chickens and, you know, you eat the wheat if it's right, you know, whatever. That's what you're going to do. Well, what do the Russians do as they retreat? They burn everything. They burn their own country. Why? Because you don't have anything to eat. How are you going to feed 600,000 guys if you don't have a bunch of carriages behind you with seed rations and MREs in them? You aren't. So he's going to have... <laughs> All right, you're still walking to El Paso, and you got nothing to eat, and you got 600,000 guys. Wouldn't have wanted to in there. Well, let me back up. The first time that the Russians are actually going to fight big time is going to be right here. Here's Moscow. So they go about 525 miles, and the Russians finally stand. And this is going to be in September. So they chew on them in June and July. In August, and so they finally say, You guys are tired and hungry enough, but we think we're going to fight you. And so, this Battle of Borodino, which is this is where it's going to happen, uh, happens in September, and they, they literally just stand there and finally fight. Now, this battle is famous because of the number of people killed 85,000 people killed at this battle, both sides, and it's the largest number of deaths in any battle in history to that time and then up until World War I. So that's how big and how significant this battle is. Um, who's going to win? Russians are. They overpower the Russian, you know, the people with, uh, or the, the Russians with the numbers. And so Napoleon goes the last 60 miles into Moscow. He comes up on this ridge line, looks down on the Moscow with triumph in his mind, expecting the Tsar there, waving a white flag. And what does he find? Two things. 
But one, he doesn't find, because the czar in their way from white flag, the czar's up to St. Petersburg saying, nanny, nanny, poo-poo, come and get me if you, if you really want me. But what have the Russians done to Moscow? They burned it as well. So here's Napoleon standing on the bridge line. Can you imagine the frustration this guy must have felt? I mean, you got 600, well, you don't have 600,000 more because a lot of them have died by now, but you got 600,000 guys who are hungry and all this, and you've been promising them a big, big celebration, big surrender party in Moscow, and it isn't going to happen. So <laughs> Napoleon sends a message off to the Tsar and say, come to Moscow and have the decency to surrender. And the Tsar said, no, I'm not going to do that. And he's there, Napoleon's there for three or four weeks. And what starts to happen? Starts to snow. He's got no food. His guys are tired. So what does he do? They leave. So now fences, starting in October, they got to go what? 600 miles back. He walk back from El Paso. Now, I haven't gotten there. And now we're going to have to deal with this winter on to go back. So anytime, you know, anytime you see Napoleon, it's, it's kind of like when I when we did the American Revolution, I said, anytime you see Washington in the snow, where is he? Valley Forge. See Washington in the snow? There he's in Valley Forge again. It's the same thing with Napoleon. You see Napoleon in the in the snow, he's walking back or he's riding back from uh, from Moscow in that in that terrible winter. Forty thousand. He loses five hundred and sixty thousand Frenchmen on this fight. Now, if you've been to the Kremlin in Moscow, this is a picture that, that Pam and I took, they have hundreds of these cannon just kind of stacked around the walls of the Kremlin. They said, what are those? They said, well, those are the, those are the, the cannon that Napoleon left behind. And the Russians today, what, 190 years later, well, 200 years later now, proudly display out there around the Kremlin, all these hundreds of cannons that point because they didn't have horses to take them back. Why? What happened to the horses? They ate them. You know, so it's just I, <laughs> this is just a cavalcade of theirs. So, you're going to lose 560,000 guys. Uh, again, anytime you see any of this, it's no blame snow. Now, he's a politician. He's got to get back to Paris and spin his tail before the soldiers do. Because what does he need to do? He needs to raise another army. And so here he is, racing out of Russia to get back to Paris before the soldiers do. So he can tell, kind of, you should have seen those rivers. They were eight feet tall, and I mean, you know, they had us at a disadvantage. So I mean, they're just, I need another army to go back and get them. And what's France going to do? They're going to give him another army. And the next spring, he's going to go back out on campaign again with this new army. Distance and cold, great allies of the Russians. Who else is going to be defeated by distance and cold? Hitler. Hitler. Same thing. When we talk about World War II in here, it's going to be the same thing. You say, you've got to be kidding. Don't the Russians ever, you know, I mean, do the Germans? They, weren't they not reading history? No, they were in high school sitting next to the guy that you saw through the next year who was throwing spit wads and doing all that. <laughs> rather than paying attention to history. So... Um, Okay, so the next spring, he sets out again. And this time he's met at Leipzig, uh, which is up in, in what we would call uh, current-day Poland today, or East Germany, Eastern Germany. There is an alliance of five countries that beat him there, and uh, they defeat him again. And this time, though, they chase him. And they chase him back into Paris. They actually surround him in Paris and basically tell the French people, we just want one thing. We just want Napoleon. We're not going to destroy your country. We're not going to defeat your country. We're going to put controls on it so you don't come out and do this again to us in the near future. We just want Napoleon. Turn him over. And what, is the, what do the people of France do? They turn him over. And what happens to him? To Napoleon. He goes into exile. Anybody know, remember where? Elba. 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 All right, he's going to go into exile. Right. Let, me, let me go back here. Yeah, I know. Is this happy Napoleon or sad Napoleon? <laughs> sad Napoleon. Things are not going the way he wants. We have some pouting going on there. If we have a five-year-old grandchild looks kind of like this occasionally? Well, five could be 14, the way things 
Okay, so he's going to go to Elba. Here's Elba right here. He's actually transported there by an English ship. He's 45 years old, as you can see all this up here. They actually give him um, rule of Elba. He gets, he has, what is 25,000 people. So he goes from ruling 80 million in Europe to 25,000 in Elba. They give him 400 guys, as a, you know, kind of like Secret Service to kind of guard him. He does try to commit suicide once with poison, and he's found and failed. And, you know, they make him throw up, and, and he survives that. But what he hears going on back in France gives him hope. Because now that he's left, who's taken over France? Got to go back to the French Revolution like last month. Who's still out there? A Louis. Some Louis. <laughs> Remember the brother of Louis the Sixteenth? Louis the Sixteenth, the guy got his head chopped off. Remember he had a son that everyone, a royalist after Louis the Sixteenth, got his head chopped off. They called the son Louis the Seventeenth, and then he died of tuberculosis. And the brother, who is where? England. Remember he was one of those nobles that ran away. He's sitting over there in England. He says France. Here I am. Right? You need somebody to rule France? And what does France do? They have an opportunity here to achieve what they meant to achieve in the French Revolution, which was freedom from monarchy. Do they take it? Nope. They invite this guy to come back. So here comes Louis the 18th. <laughs> Clearly pursuing some sort of fitness regimen at the spa in England. Comes back with a gout, as you can tell. He is 59 years old. He claims that he is returning in the 19th year of his reign because it's been 19 years since his young nephew passed away and, uh, and turned the supposed of the throne over to him. Does this guy promise <clears throat> much for France? No. Well, he comes in, he takes over, and Napoleon immediately starts getting feedback from the people of France, his friends in Paris, we are not happy with this guy. Come on back. So what does Napoleon do? He escapes from Elba with the intent of going back to Paris to take over. So he leaves um, with about 700 soldiers. By the time he gets to the border of France, coming out of Italy, coming up into France, he has 1,100 guys with him. A posse was sent out from Paris. The king sends out a posse, basically. 500 guys says, go get Napoleon and take him back to Elba. <coughs> Another great scene in history. This posse is riding down the road. Here comes Napoleon and his group, basically head on in this little valley. And Napoleon tells these guys, wait here. He rides to this posse of 500 guys, many of them former soldiers of his, rides up to them and says, if any of you want to shoot your emperor, here I am. The guts of this guy. And what happens? They throw up their hats. Viva la Napoleon. Let's go back to France. And they're going to welcome this guy back in. So one of the great scenes in history. Napoleon riding up to these guys and saying, shoot me if you want to. But if you're not going to shoot me, let's go back to Paris and I'll become your emperor again. And so that's what happens. Um, and of course, here he is being welcomed back in. All right. So he's now back in Paris. What happens to Louis XVIII? Go back to England. We're going to go back to England. We're going to hang out in England there for a while. See what happens with Napoleon. What does Napoleon want of the French people? Another army. Because he's going to go out again. <laughs> we have some slow learners. All right, so this is, this is just recapping. 720 mile march, 20 days. Uh, so he's going, what, like 36 miles a day to get back to Paris? All right, so he's going to set out. And this is what sets up the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, so he's going to have the army to go out, and now the British have joined. You know, it's always been the Austrians, the Prussians, the Russians have been all, but the British are going to jump in this time. And they're going to meet on this very famous battlefield, a ferocious battlefield outside of uh, uh, Brussels, just north of Brussels. Some of you have been there, perhaps have seen this monument, you know, that commemorates where Waterloo is. Um, ferocious fighting here. Um, the British leaders, the Duke of Wellington, same guy that defeated, helped defeat him in, in Portugal, so this is where he's going to be um, famous. Uh, the same meets his Waterloo. As they catch him, as he is retreating from the running, from this battlefield, he is going to a ship that he has already set up on the French coast to take him to the United States. 
And the British spies have found out about this, and that's how they intercepted him and keep him going from the United States. I don't know what we would have done if Waterloo would have showed up on our shoreline. That would have been an interesting political uh, dilemma to deal with. The last land battle fought between England and France. So it started in 1066, and here we are in 1812, and that, that competition finally, uh, finally comes to an end. All right, so where are we going to send Napoleon this time? He was too close last time. Last time, he was just off the coast of Italy. He's just down there south of France. So we got to do something more with this guy. So where are they going to send him this time? St. Helena, which is about 600 miles off the, off, west off the coast of Africa. That's far enough away they figure this time that he's probably going to be okay. So here's the statistic I was talking to you about later. So he's in power for 3,680 days, but he spends less than 1,000 of that actually in Paris. That's how much time he spends out uh, in Europe trying to conquer. A uh, political cartoon of him, Old Habits Die Hard, which is how you translate this. So here is Napoleon down on St. Helena training the rats. All right, so he just got need somebody to train, so he's training the rats down there. He is going to die on St. Helena of what ailment, do we think? Stomach cancer. We think that it's stomach cancer that finally kills him. There's a lot of thought that perhaps he was poisoned. They have taken samples of his hair in, in time since and done tests for arsenic and that kind of thing, and they found no greater levels of arsenic in his hair than was existent in Europeans at that time anyway. So they think that it's, and they thought it maybe it was poisoning from the cook who lost his son in the army, you know, the French army, and there's all sorts of different conspiracy theories out there, but they think it was, it was mostly stomach cancer. Um, and then he lies uh, in his tomb in Paris. That's where he is now. So let's go back and pick up Josephine. He, she has been divorced since we last mentioned Josephine. So they have 14 years of marriage, no, no children. And we have said, I don't know how many times I have said this in, this in this lecture series, what is the only job that a queen has? Produce an heir. Fair and spares. And she doesn't do it. And it's obviously her fault. All right, so we've got to get rid of her, just like Henry VIII and all that did you know, previously. Um, so they're divorced in 1810. She, he gives her a nice chateau. He says, I still like you very much. All this, I just need to have an heir, and you're not doing it for me. Uh, so you'll see here, she dies of pneumonia. And this is a painting of him having told her of the divorce, supposedly, and how distraught she is. And this, again, is very romantic. Supposedly, his last words on St. Helena as, his die, as he dies is... Um, come on, all you're all supposed to show up. Joseph, he, you know, he, he passes away. So that's, you know, that's the romantic side of that. Okay, so who's number two? Number two is Marie Louise. This is a painting of her here. She's a niece of Marie Antoinette. Here we have this queen that had her head chopped off. Her, right now we're bringing her niece in. Now as the new empress of France. Married in proxy, that means there's a representative uh, sent to uh, uh, Vienna to marry. Napoleon and her, just like what happened with Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI, same thing. I think I, I think I remember it took 56 carriages to bring Marie Antoinette's stuff. It takes 83 carriages to bring her stuff to uh, Paris from uh, Austria. They have one son. This is a picture of the son after he was born. He's going to die about 21 years old with tuberculosis, so he's not going to be in play as far as ruling France is concerned. But this is the interesting part about this young lady. Uh, Napoleon sent her, when he was on Elba, uh, she, he sent for her to come to Elba and, and be with him. And she found this guy attractive. Handsome, <laughs> handsome and attentive. So she runs off with him and never sees Napoleon again. Uh, so she just leaves him to his, his own devices and eventually is going to have three kids uh, with him. So that's the end of that part of the story. Uh, Napoleon is believed to have had 16 missions. I mean, come on. If you're on the road for over 3,000 days, you've got to have mistresses, right? <laughs> Ham shaker had no up here, so I guess I can't have mistresses. But um, 16 of them for him. The most famous is this gal, who is a countess in Poland. Um, when he's in Poland that winter, getting ready to launch the next year or summer into Moscow, he basically takes over this count's house, and as he comes in, he's legendarily said, you can stay here whether you want to or not but your wife is mine for this winter. And that's kind of how he handled that. And um, so there is an offspring that results from this. Um, uh, 
and he's going to be a, uh, a representative of the Polish government eventually uh, in Paris. Um, okay, so let's wrap this up. So what's Napoleon's mark on history? Um, as his soldiers go from country to country, they spread the idea of revolution. And as these soldiers are talking to farmers and shopkeepers and all this, as they move it, they inspire and they say, hey, the people of America have done it, the people of France have done it, we can too. So next fall, we're going to talk about all of these revolutions. And those of you that have seen Les Miserables, there's going to be another revolution that comes to Paris, and that's when that play is set. So this, this idea of revolution uh, is going to be, um, all, of, all of this liberal thought is going to be spread throughout Europe. Nationalism. Nationalism in the last, what, three or four years has really got a bad rap. Meaning, you know, me first and all that. But it really starts off as a very positive thing if you are anti-monarchical. As Napoleon comes through these countries and conquers them, the people draw together to defend their homeland. And that's what nationalism starts out as being. This very noble cause to defend yourself against this ignoble invader that has come into your country. So no, nationalism goes from that very positive aspect of things to what it's become today, which is uh, probably a shame. All right, so the other things for Poland, of course, he's the one that sells us uh, Louisiana. Great deal for Thomas Jefferson. Uh, there in the day, we'll get to that here. Four cents an acre. Whew, good deal. Uh, his famous saying about France, I found the crown of France in the gutter and lifted it up on the tip of my sword. And he was as good a man as could be without virtue. So he was going to do anything he possibly could. He joins what historians call the four greatest military commanders prior to 1850. So here's Napoleon. Who's this guy? Alexander the Great of Greece, around 400 BC. How about this guy? Hannibal of Carthage in the Punic Wars back around the 3rd BC. And Julius Caesar. So historians generally say these four guys are the top four military commanders up to 1850. What happens in 1850 that we have to recategorize our thoughts about who great military commanders are? Technology. Because what comes into play around 1850 on the battlefield? Rifles. Rifles? Cannon. Cannon with rifle barrels. Well, artillery. The telegraph, the steam engine. There are all sorts of things that come on the cusp of the Industrial Revolution that changes the battlefield forever. Can you imagine what Napoleon could have done with a railroad? Or a telegraph? Or Caesar could have done with those things? Amazing. A lot easier to move 600 guys or 600,000 guys to El Paso if you got a train. Than walk. And so you know, that's why, what, so as we make our march through history and we talk about these other military commanders, that is, uh, uh, that is what is going to come into impact. All right, the last thing I'm going to say is that France ends up, this blue part here, that's what it goes back to. It used to be all of this under Napoleon, and then it's going to go back to just this. And the last thing I want to say about this is that there is a peace. Uh, in Vienna. There's a peace meeting in Vienna uh, that all these countries of Europe come to, and they establish a peace that is going to last for 40 years. And it's the longest continuous period of peace that exists in Europe for the last 500 years. Uh, and it's going to be created because Europe says, we don't want another Napoleon, and we're going to do what we have to do to control finance, so it stays where it is, and then all, of the, all the rest of us, we're just going to exist in peace. So if there's one positive thing that comes out of this, is 40 years of peace for Europe, which is virtually unheard of, uh, given that area of the world. Okay, that's Napoleon. <laughs> some of you are able to be glassy-eyed, because some of, this, like, some, of the, when you, some of this stuff I said, you kind of shook your head, and you say, I can't believe that's really true. It really is. All right? I try not to tell too many fibs. Pam says I make them, well, no, Sid is the one who says I make things up. But I really did. All right, so next month we're going to do... Uh, the Romantic Age and the uh, Scientific Revolution. And Franck, thank you very much for all the help that you give us. You guys need to give Franck a round of applause. Okay, thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you.